right, guys. Today we are joined by John Fern. He is an endurance and adventure coach. John, how are you doing? Very well, thank you. Yeah, um, had a really nice start to the day. Skinned up a mountain, skied back down, and then went for a hike up to a beautiful lake this afternoon and now back home. Yeah, so not a bad day, shall we say. You're living the life, living the life. Yeah. <laughs> um, what, what part of the world are you in, John? Um, based just outside Chamonix, so living in the Chamonix Valley, French Alps. Very nice, very nice. And in, in that part of the world, how uh, how's it been affected by the global pandemic we've been having? It seems like obviously you're doing still out doing a few bits, so it's not too yeah. crazy there. I mean, it started for us back uh, March the 17th. Uh, I remember the day because we there wasn't much snow. We chucked skis on our backpacks and we cycled up to the snow line. And so we're just coming around to a year now. So the major thing that we've had in this valley is there's been no ski season. So no lifts are running, no holidays allowed, etc. So for us locals, it, it's not so bad because we just ski tour, which means we stick them on and we get up the mountains and we come back down. But yeah. for a lot of industry, it's it's really, really difficult. It's been hard. Um, for sure. Yeah. So it's not it's not been great. And the differences with France and the UK, I think we started our lockdowns really early and they were really strict. Mm -hmm. And then that's kind of eased off. And now the UK seem to have flipped and you're doing your really hard lockdowns. And we're kind of, we have a curb, we have to be indoors by 6 p.m. and we're not allowed out before 6 a.m. But that's it. Okay, that's not too bad. I kind of guess that's in with the, the daylight hours kind of around this time of year. Maybe yeah. a little longer. Yeah, it's starting to get, get lighter in the evening, so you're starting to get itchy and want to be out longer for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. And John, where where did you originate from? Is it you from the UK originally? Yeah, from I uh, lived down the south of England, Bournemouth, Salisbury area. Um, I was born and raised sort of Kent, firstly, and then moved, obviously. Uh, so yeah, a man of Kent. Um, we still have a home in the UK, which we, we let out. Uh, so it's our kind of like feet in two camps, so to speak. You know, if everything goes a little bit south here, we can still get back to the UK because we won't we won't mention the whole Brexit thing because this isn't a not a political podcast. <laughs> no, we haven't got so much time to go into yeah, that. Sort of thing. Definitely not. But, um, lovely. I know Bournemouth well. I'm actually based in Pool myself. So ah, uh, excellent. Yeah. Um, lovely. So when. When did it all start for you then? When did this adventure into becoming an endurance coach, an adventure coach, an athlete as well, when did it kick off for you in the UK? Um, as, as a real young lad, um, as nine years old, I was diagnosed with ADHD or what was called back then um, hyperactivity. And I was really, really fortunate that my school just threw me into sport. And they kind of like, he isn't going to sit still, he's not behaving let's not kick him out let's throw sport at him and ever since then somehow sport has always been my go-to and it's kind mm -hmm. of developed through mainstream sports and then it went more into like surf instructing kayak instructing sports science degree uh co-wrote masters and then it went more down the direction of the adventure again so it kind of it's swung around um but yeah, it's definitely firmly placed at the moment in the endurance and the adventure side of the industry. No, no. It's interesting you said about ADHD because when I remember when I was at school, um, I was on the cross country team and one of the other really good cross country athletes had ADHD. And one of his main things to like keep his focus, to keep him going at school was to do sport. He was good at football. He was good at yeah. cross country. He was pretty much good at all sports. And that was his kind of thing he grasped to at school and what made him like graduate in the end. So yeah. it's amazing that that's uh, the same it, for you. No, it is really good. Like I said, I was really, really fortunate. Those, the, fortunately, those teachers have passed away now. There's Mr. and Mrs. Bunnell at the primary school and they just, they locked onto it. And, you know, I could have just been another kid with issues that just got in trouble yeah. and bounced school to school, but they took the time and the energy to realize what I needed to do with my energy. And it's been an absolute go-to. And the thing I find with it quite funny now is I'll still use it as a way to control. But as we get older, we kind of like we get the agitated side but we don't recover from the exercises quick so we're kind of like i need to go out but i'm too tired to go out so yeah it's an interesting <laughs> dynamic yeah for sure uh, age catches up with us all recovery is oh yeah much needed, <laughs> definitely but um so where did the the athlete side start for you then was that in like early early teens 
yeah um what for myself competitively um, yeah when did you yeah. start competitive for like so, sport junior international athletics was my go-to it was actually high jump and four by 100 meter relays and i had mm -hmm. an amazing coach uh, at school he was the, one of the pe teachers as well and something back then i was even when i was about 12 or 13 i would love to take the 11 year olds the first years and take them out and show them what i was doing and i kind of learned that i had more of an affinity with helping others do than i did myself you know i yeah. I love to take part as a way of coping and challenging myself, but actually the reward from helping others just kind of like tip the scales. Um, yeah. So it was at a very, very young age. And I think it was after five years, my coach actually moved schools and actually kind of really left me in a limbo and made me really aware of just how important that kind of a role model, because mm -hmm. coaching isn't necessarily just about the, the physical side and the, the psychological side of an event or a challenge. It's actually just being there holistically as a person as well. You know, you become really friendly with a lot of people. On the adventure side, you're coaching people that are going to places that it is life or death. So their mm. fitness is actually that important and their psychology is that important. You can't not kind of get close to people. So, yeah, there's a definite connection with that. Yeah, no, definitely, especially as you mentioned, adventure racing there. They're going to extreme situations. Um, some of them very experienced, some people not as experienced. So they're yeah. really, really looking for that kind of connection. They've got to trust in their, the person that's teaching them, that's coaching them to give the best information. Yeah, but, exactly. Um, no, it's cool. And when, when you said you moved more towards like the extreme style of sport a little bit later on, what was the first kind of extreme event you've done? Um, well, I've, I, first, I still believe the only athlete to have run across and mountain biked across the Alps. So that's completed mm -hmm. Transalp and Transalpine. They're seven days, continual stages across the mountains. Um, mm -hmm. That was my transition more, I think, from stepping away from real competition and thinking, yeah, I'm, I'm getting older. I've done a lot of raced Ironman around the world. I've done other things. It's kind of like, actually, the challenge element is becoming more important to me. And that those events really made that click. And I was kind of like, yeah, okay, my racing element can just go to one side. I want to focus on personal challenge and, and personal development as well in that direction. Yeah. No, definitely. We've seen a, a bit of a bit of a rise this year where there's been less events. There's been less mm -hmm. um, like official events on. People are going towards a lot of fastest known time routes. Yeah. Um, you've got what Land's End, John O'Groats, that's like a very big uh, famous challenge. You've seen a lot of top end athletes, uh, Killian Jornet going for 24 hour. Yeah. Um, there's different um, people going for different challenges, but definitely seeing people move towards something, same as you found like a bit more of a personal challenge, personal yeah. goals. Um, no, that's amazing. Um, across the Alps, what was that like? Was that uh, a it pretty was... crazy terrain up there? Yeah, I mean, you're going across a lot of summits, some over 3000 meters, and you're kind of you're in shorts and a run top, you've obviously got all of your safety stuff in your vest, but you're quite exposed and you're traveling very, very light. So you mentioned Killian there is, you know, you kind of want to go as light and as quickly as you possibly can. Um, it's an eye opener, I'd say the biking side of it is harder, but then I'm not as much a natural biker and the technical side mm -hmm. of getting down off the mountains is a little bit more challenging so on foot i was a lot more comfortable um but the places you go are just beautiful absolutely stunning yeah. the the stage villages starts and finishes are quite small places so they're not your big mm -hmm. like your chamonix or morzines or anything they're quite small so you get a really good atmosphere there no definitely and um seen kind of a rise in that mountain running with sky mm. running making it a bit more popular um to like the normal watcher or a tra yeah. trail people who are interested in trail running you're seeing like killian journey john alban doing sky running races um was that that kind of style of like scrambling across the top of mountains um some only in very small sections uh i mm. mean killian i mean believe it or not he actually lived in the apartment just down from me for a long time before they moved to Norway. So he's in this valley, he's obviously really well known. Um, he, he pushes those boundaries. You know, he's an amazing talent and there are other people similar to him that do those things. In a racing environment, I wouldn't feel so safe when I go into the higher mountains, say Mont Blanc, which he will run up and down. 
in like five six hours you know i could yeah. be a couple of days going to the summit and back you know so it's <laughs> it's very different and i'll have crampons and ice axe and be treating it as a very different environment to him um but i mean youtube is an absolute wash with those solomon videos that you see nowadays and they oh, yeah. do inspire people because you're kind of holding your breath thinking how <laughs> yeah how has he not just fallen off the side of there so yeah it's yeah, very it's inspiring theme on. Yeah. um and it's crazy some of the feats he's managed to achieve over the years um so for yourself what uh, you said you've done some iron man races and some 70.3s and you qualified for world championships i believe one year yeah, 70.2 yeah 2009 at Wimbledon which doesn't exist anymore uh it used to be one of the world's hardest uh 70.3s it was Wimbledon monaco uh, i don't think monaco yeah. exists anymore either they've gone by the by but they were really tough um hilly the bike ride at Wimbledon is brutally <clears throat> hilly and then the run was a much more of a trail focused run a little mm -hmm. more similar to like exterior um and I absolutely loved that. It was a beautiful venue in Exmoor, stunning. Um, so yeah, I qualified there. I didn't take my slot because I was pursuing Kona, and I missed mm -hmm. Kona by two places. So one of those, one of those, yeah, so close. so close. Wow. Yeah, it's twice that's that happened. You have to sit there oh. and listen to the roll down, and yeah, no good. But um, so, is what's the the most recent? project you've been working on is there any kind of like personal project or personal events you've been doing as an athlete still yeah i mean uh 17 years ago i summited tabukal in morocco which is the highest mountain in north africa it's 4167 meters and i went back on my son's birthday actually because he was a year old at the time i went back and i ran up in six hours 57 minutes and back down which is something that took three days to do before okay. it's so uh, that was my killian kind of like effort but it's nowhere near as technical as mont blanc or everest um but at the moment uh we are we were due to start april the first as a bit of a joke given the last 12 months but i'm kayaking the length of france on all the inland oh, wow. waterways it's 1,235 kilometers. Um, but at the moment, there's some parts of France that you're not allowed to travel through. So, yeah, logistical nightmare. Yeah. So, but everything's in place. Sponsors are amazing. Boats are all good to go. Uh, as soon as we get the COVID all clear, then <laughs> that will happen, which will be really yeah. exciting. Nice. That'd be very interesting to, uh, to watch your progress. Are you going to be? Yeah putting that out live on your instagram or yeah website? i will do live instagrams we'll make a little bit of a mini doco on it as well um it's it's kind of more to try and get other people to take on different challenges and realize it doesn't have to cost the earth it doesn't have to be mm -hmm. life-threatening you know you can find challenges within your own country within your own county especially with the last 12 months where travel so restricted i chose something that was based in france that shouldn't be impacted by travel and lo and behold it's impacted by travel <laughs> <laughs> yeah unfortunately yeah. everything's impacted right now which is yeah. crazy but uh, no it sounds like a, a great endeavor a very interesting project for you to go on yeah, cheers um, but obviously alongside um your athletic endeavors you've pursued coaching as well and i've seen mm -hmm. from talking to you you've had a very um strong interest in coaching from a young age yeah. um how has being a coach been for you it seems like you've coached athletes from all different backgrounds adventure racing triathlon running mountaineering mm -hmm. what's that been like as a coach there's so many different uh, facets to look at um it's it's amazing and it keeps everything fresh. The most important thing for me is, as a coach, we can learn from all these other areas. Um, a lot, a lot mm -hmm. of coaches, the great coaches, but they are, say, a triathlon coach. And that's all they will ever think about or look at. Whereas actually, mm -hmm. when you start to, say, look at an ultra runner or you look at some other athletes, there's things that cross over that are actually really helpful. <laughs> and as a coach, we've always got to be trying to push our understanding of the physiology and the psychology of what goes on with ourselves and with our athletes. And so having a wider array of, I guess, your arsenals wider with um, all these different types of events, you learn so much more from so many people. And that's what really inspires me to keep going um, and keep pursuing and keep perfecting it. Because 
and no, no way do I know everything. Never will. You know, it's always a journey of learning as a coach as well as an athlete. So I'm always looking to find that next way to find something that could help one athlete over here that's doing, say, an obstacle event, and then there's one over here that's maybe rowing the Atlantic. There might suddenly be something that happens. And for me, I think the rowing the Atlantic ones is in some ways the more challenging to coach because I don't row. So I've yeah. had to learn an awful lot about the the rowing technique, the ways they've got to train, as well as mixing in the psychology of being stuck in a little boat in the middle of the Atlantic, yeah. which which freaks me out. It's the one thing I need to go and do because it scares me more than anything. But yeah, definitely. that kind of inspires me to go research and keep pushing my own knowledge, which then obviously filters back down to the athletes. No, it's definitely, and as you just mentioned, then you'd like to do something that scares you or mm -hmm. something that's unknown to you. Um, how you, you must see that so many times with these athletes coming to you, like I've never done this, but it scares me enough of me wanting to do it. Especially more yeah. of the the personal kind of endeavors and projects. Mm -hmm. um, how how have you found that? Um, it's it's an interesting one, and it's really nice sometimes to actually have an athlete come to me with something that's new and that scared them. That's actually mm -hmm. new to me as well. So you, you actually, you're starting your journey, your process with them, which gives that stronger connection again. Um, I've had, uh, was it in 2019, 20 season in the South pole, an amazing lady, Wendy Searle, mama four, phenomenal never done that before it obviously has to do the safety training prior to yeah. going to antarctica but she was the fastest lady against professional athletes you know to reach the south pole unsupported and that's that's scary in the sense that you're on your own you know you no one's coming to get you in a hurry it's going to take a while mm -hmm. to be rescued um you've got 37 to 40 days of solitude whilst working your butt off try not to get too hot try not to get too cold it's an incredibly scary place to go um so working through that with her we came up with great training practices ice baths different horrible as she'd say the horrible nasty sessions that i would set her but when she finished it she was so grateful for having done those yeah so yeah i think anyone that comes to me with a new challenge is great mm -hmm. i absolutely i love that i love to be made to think can i actually coach this person mm -hmm. and i would always be honest if i thought actually do you know what i can't do this it hasn't happened yet touch wood but i would always say do you know what you know i can't do this and i don't know if you can hear me but you appear to have frozen luke Oh, you're back. Sorry, you froze oh, yeah. for a moment. I don't know. What... No, I think it just dropped out. The, the weather's having a, uh, a bit of a weird one. Yeah. There we go. I think that's come back now, John. Ah, cool. Okay. That's all right. I'll message that down. I'll, edit that. I'll get my editor to take that out. That's yeah, like no problem. No worries. 30 seconds. The weather's being crazy here. Um... <laughs> You just want to rewind and just say that last little bit you were talking about? Um, yeah, just uh, when someone comes to me with um, a new challenge that maybe I've not dealt with before, mm -hmm. I, I jump at the chance, uh, but I'd always be open and honest with them and kind of say, look, you know, this is my expertise. This is my history. I can see how it connects to what you're doing and I'm happy to work with you and find ways in which we can get you ready. Um, mm. And that's to date. That's always worked. Um, like say with the rowers, I get more rowers now. That again, it comes from once you've worked with one and then you get, it, it spirals, they talk, etc. cetera. Um, but you know, that initial one is, it's a learning curve. Um, and again, it sends me back to the drawing board, makes me revisit basic physiology, etc., cetera, and different things, which is always good. Every coach should always kind of hit a reset button and go, actually, you know, maybe I'm getting too complacent with how I coach and train people. I need to rewind, go back and have a look at things again. No, definitely. That kind of brings up two, uh, two key points for me from that. You said there was like a, a mum of four, she's trained to do something. She's gone and done amazingly well going out to 
you know, Antarctica and then racing across there. Do, do you think there's a lot of people that don't really know that they could do a challenge or they could be gr really good at something until they give that a go or kind of break through the barrier? Um, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. No, I think it's, it's a really good question. I think the way that I guess modern society is well, we have so many barriers that pop up and most of them are barriers in our own minds that, that mm -hmm. create, we create through certain social pressures, um, social standing, social placing, etc. which actually there are ways beyond those, which again is something I love to help people with um, is to try and make them realize that they could achieve more than what they're actually doing. And I would love in some way to actually reach people and spread the word that actually you, you don't have to be complacent with where you are. You know, you can do some of these things. You won't necessarily have to be as quick as Killian, but hey, yeah. you can go up a mountain. But a lot of mm -hmm. people say, well, no, I just can't do that. Well, you can, you know, let's look at how we remove those barriers for you and get you into that place. Um, yeah, there's nothing more rewarding than seeing someone that's had to remove an awful lot of barriers um, to actually get where they want to be or maybe even where they didn't even know they wanted to be and then suddenly yeah. they're there and it's like wow i've actually done this um i work with a, another amazing athlete sarah crossland who's a brain tumor survivor and went through real battles and she's now she's climbed mountains she's coming out here to do mont blanc she's run ultra marathons and still you know she has balance issues and sickness issues but she works her way through it and you know it's super inspiring when you get to meet and work with people like that yeah no i think from that it's kind of like sport is one of those ultimate barrier breakers because mm. um, you can use sport in a lot of different ways it can be an endurance sport event it can be a cycling event some kind of event there'll always be some kind of sport you can do to Definitely. break the barrier that yeah. you thought was like a leveler yeah um, i think so I just to, just to mention as well is like you know coming away like I said uh, originally was like the team and the more institutionalized sports that were there. Yeah, there's so many more breakaway sports now, and there's so much more kudos and respect for the extreme sports. So even skateboarding, BMXing, you, you know, the world has opened up to all of these really creative and amazing sports. Whereas you look back 30, 40 years ago, mm. it was you know it was athletics, football, rugby they dominated yeah. everything. If you did something to the side of that, uh, if you were one of these groundbreakers like Tony Hawk or whoever, you were like shunned. It was like, well, who are you? <laughs> and yet now you look, uh, you know, they dominate the world. And it, I think it's really good to see. And I hope that more things, more progression comes along those lines. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, and the second point I was going to mention from the bit you said before was that with all of these kind of barrier breaking and projects and sporting events, the one key thing from that is a coach is there to help you. Um, it seems to be the people that are excelling or are doing very well at this are having a coach, somebody that they can bounce these ideas off, help them with the training. Um, obviously you're coaching a lot of amazing people to do stuff. I'm sure, do they, I'm sure they've, uh, positively responded to your coaching and improved over the different times. Um, how have you seen that as a coach? Has it helped them having a coach? What's the kind of feedback from those athletes? Um, it's really interesting. So I say to most athletes that I start to work with, and they'll, they'll probably quote me as it's, it's not brain surgery. Mm. It's, you know, it, it's actually quite a simplistic approach and the world kind of with everything complicates things, you know, it adds new methods, new things, Let's have this pair of shoes, have that bike, do the, and it just becomes crazy complicated. It's oh, crazy. Yeah. It's like, well, I've researched it and everyone's saying I should, I don't know, there's this new invention called the skipping rope I see at the moment. It's like, well, the skipping rope's been around for, I don't know how long. It's like you ask a boxer and, you know, they've been skipping, skipping yeah um but it seems like it's a new training method now to skip anyway yeah um yeah so the, the i always tell them that what i try to do is you become they you're taking away the stress of trying to organize their training what can happen with a lot of individual athletes so is, is questions so they're always like oh was that right oh should i run a bit more oh it's a beautiful day i'm going to 
double my run or my bike ride or yeah. whereas a coach would be no no we stick to what we're doing we follow a systematic pattern we develop and we progress and yeah. for many to start with it's difficult because actually it seems really simple and uncomplicated and they're kind of like was well, this working is this right and yeah. they hit a period could be four to six weeks where normal physiological adaptation starts to take place and they're like oh i get this wow i just ran that mile like so much quicker with my heart rate still at the same intensity as it was four weeks ago i'm like well yeah that's fitness development <laughs> and when they get that as any athlete gets a physical connection to something because we're all obviously we're physical people we get feedback all the time from what we're doing in our training our sports once they get that it's like a click a switch has gone they're like okay yeah i get it i'll listen and i'll follow and they continue um i have three times world endurance mountain bike champion steve day that mm -hmm. before i started working with him he was just thrashing himself and thrashing himself and he was still he's an incredible athlete an amazing athlete yeah. But I basically, I just slowed him down. And then a year and a half later, he goes on a spree of winning three world titles. And all I've technically done is got him to stop thrashing himself. So yeah, there's maybe there is little bits more to it, maybe the study and stuff behind it, but on the surface of things, it's pretty simple. Yeah, no, definitely. I think um, what you're saying there's like e education is kind of key, but it's more for you to like simplify the education down to those athletes and just kind of give them the plug and play plan that they can follow. But what I've said to people I've coached in the past is like consistency. Um, yeah, definitely. Have, yeah, it's just consistency of hitting those things that being put out by the coach and over time we're very impatient nowadays it's all yeah. i want it i want it i want yeah, it yeah. It's, uh, if it's not instantaneous if it's not a like on instagram people don't want to know no. um it's that instant sport. gratification that they want yes. yeah it's Definitely. and yeah you know, instagram everywhere is full of it i mean i've signed up for so many get my six pack in three weeks <laughs> it hasn't happened yet <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, sorry we should we shouldn't i shouldn't make fun but i am sorry <laughs> uh, no it's true there's, yeah. there's so much information out there now unfortunately yeah. a lot of information is just uh flair mm -hmm. and talk um but obviously people like yourself you've been coaching for how many years 20 years something like this yeah it's probably over that um but i'd say professionally yeah 20 years um like i said i've always had an interest in it i'm now 44 so yeah it's got to be 20 years professionally across yeah like I say many endurance and adventure sports that's it yeah. so it's many years of education you learning new things changing with the times tried and tested methods and the fact, what you like you're saying about the skip and rope things that were <laughs> great in the past coming back again like retro retro thing yeah. i've seen loads of people like oh i found this i'm like 20 years ago they were doing that yeah i've seen people doing this but over like the recent year i guess the big one what sports science has really mm -hmm. improved a lot and that's helped um what how do you test your athletes what kind of testing do you do for them I'm so sure that's a big part of it. yeah when i was based in the uk i utilized um my university that i graduated from in southampton so i had a really good relationship with them that's mm -hmm. where i helped co-wrote co-write the msc masters in athlete development and peak performance um and i'd forever use that lab i've done hundreds of tests in their lab and I utilize them a lot because I love universities because they're always learning. They're not just a business mm -hmm. trying to put something out there to sell. To them, it's like they have students, they you know, PhD students, MSc students, they're wanting to learn and develop. So you're getting really up-to-date methods and protocols, yeah. um, which I loved. But then I also have a great working relationship with Talk um, Nutrition and they have a testing facility that they use as well so i've sent athletes to them predominantly for the biking because they're much very much a biking sort of testing yeah, facility um but i i do love that i'm by no means i don't call myself a geeky scientist as i'd say to anyone in the lab is give me the numbers and then i'll use the psychology to get the numbers across to the athlete i'm like a yeah. conduit between the science and the person um 
because yeah the numbers are like you know i had to do it for my degree etc and i understand it but i don't get turned on by it like so we say some of the lab the lab people do <laughs> but it, it, it does have a, a a massive use but again when i first sort of started it would cost so much money to get someone to a lab you know it was only professional athletes that were doing it but now you can get into university labs all around the country for pretty cheap you know it's a good subsidiary income for universities and so the pricing's mm -hmm. come down the quality of testing's gone up the types of testing um have improved as well and expanded um yeah so it's, it's a really important element but i wouldn't want it to be a barrier to someone because it's still you know you can still train and be exceedingly successful i have athletes that don't ever get that kind of testing we just do in-house testing and it, you know maybe they could get better results if they went to a lab but yeah yeah who knows you, well you can, get, you can get so much data nowadays just from like a watch yeah. so much information okay it may not be the same level of a lab test it may not be 98 percent or in those top ranges mm -hmm. but it gives you a, a base level something to work from or towards definitely which is very interesting yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, so the software um, behind these, the watches and training peak software, etc. From a coaching point of view, I mean, when I first started, I just emailed someone a Word document and just hope that they did what I told them. <laughs> I mean, see, I know it's crazy, isn't it? Yet now, yeah. you know, technology freaks me out, if I'm honest. Um, but it's amazing. <laughs> I can see what someone in South Africa has just done for their run, literally second by second. And there's no hiding as well. You used to say, oh, did you do your session? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you say that now, He's like, no, you didn't. <laughs> He's yeah. like, yeah. Your heart rate was 55. Yeah. Did you, did you stick to your base or your tempo? <laughs> oh, no. Oh, what? It was through the roof. <laughs> so, yeah, that, I mean, and as well, from a business model, it's mm -hmm. made what I do so much more manageable. You know, you can turn it into a career. You can work with people all around the world. Um, yeah, it yeah. does make it very useful. Yeah, definitely. It keeps people accountable. It helps you. Yeah deliver the sessions and continue delivering sessions that are going to improve them not having to revisit stuff they've not done or said they did and never did yeah, which is, a, is an interesting one yeah um i've had a little look on your website and seen all of the different things that you do i want to talk about um kind of adventure sport what what mm -hmm. um how deep are you coaching people currently with adventure sport or are you, are you participating yourself within that area so by adventure sport for me is working with it could be an adventure photographer so mm -hmm. if you look at the lights of jimmy chin the main one i worked with was alex Buis, a french photographer uh yeah. an Olymp olympic photographer as well for the climbing etc and it for them it's about they've got to be fitter than the people they go into the mountains with because they've oh, yeah. either got to be ahead they've got to work out camera stuff and yeah, that was amazing for me because I actually have been on several shoots and expeditions with him mm -hmm. and it's kind of like okay yeah I see the demand here okay yeah I'm blown out my butt how on earth would I get a camera and be ready to do something um so that kind of that's one area of adventure there's yeah. uh, people training for 8,000 meter summits which again because of the current climate things have all been bumped and so people have been put on hold for a lot of those We've got more people training for the South Pole. Um, I have mm -hmm. more people rowing the Atlantic for the Talisker Challenge this year in December, the start date. Um, i trying to think, I'm probably forgetting people, but yeah. So it's it's quite a wide array of adventure. Um, yeah. And for that, yeah, no. for, for me as well, it puts me, especially with the mountain athletes, I have to go, I go and I put myself into what some people say is, dangerous places they're not dangerous because you're you're doing it properly but for me you know dealing with exposure and stuff at times is quite mm -hmm. alarming and so you know i've made like alex work incredibly hard and then he'll take me up and scare me with this in some places where it's kind of like okay um but again that's helping my progression and understanding of an environment because when you adventure training people it's great understanding the physiology. It's great understanding psychology. But if you don't understand the environment in which they are placing to do their activity, it yes. actually almost halves your input as a coach. So mm -hmm. for like my polar athletes, I'll send myself out on 
minus 12 minus 15 nights and go and do cold camp setups because i've got to understand the impact of carrying a load and then setting up a camp etc and i'll do these kind of things just randomly every now and then when i feel i need to refresh hmm. what i'm actually coaching um yeah. So, yeah get out there in the environment and feel what they feel kind of thing yeah definitely yeah it's very interesting that you work with um like photographers as well i've never kind of thought of them as needing training but i guess really yes they do um you you think of stuff like free solo with yeah like he must have trained so hard to get those shots because he was up the wall with him and doing those kind of different things yeah um not not everything's a drone picture nowadays no no looks like it um, <laughs> yeah. but yeah those in extreme kind of environments they've got to be as fit as either the athletes or as the environment needs them to be so uh, super interesting what's um what's the most extreme environment you've trained somebody for then was it was it in the north pole or one of the poles um i'd say that the the South Pole is probably one of the more extremes from a psychological point of view because yeah. you've got to have your head squared away. If I remember saying to Wendy, you know, we, we've just got to have your head dialed in before you get there. You can't yeah. take any kind of niggles or stresses or worries because that will that will cost you dearly. Um, it's going to cost you to possibly fail. Um, mm. And it's a big expense going on these kind of expeditions as well. So that's one. And then the Atlantic rowing one is quite a freaky one for people. Um, it's weird, the psychology, because some people, they don't quite appreciate the psychology side of it because of all the training is much more either on an erg or on a river. They don't get to go on their boats very much. And then suddenly they're presented with these like 20 foot swells and the boats flipped upside down. And you're waiting for it to right itself. It's pitch black. You can't see anything in the water. You've lost nearly all your kit because you didn't shut your cabin door. Yeah, they're, they're kind of like, you know, it starts to make me feel a little thinking about it. Um, so, yeah, yeah I'd say those, those two environments for me, yeah, i say a pretty, pretty extreme. But then the mountain environments can turn very quickly. So... Yeah been caught before even on simple things out my back door where suddenly temperatures drop through the roof it's white out you can't see where you are and if at that point your fitness isn't there and you're getting tired you start to make mistakes so that's where they've got to be totally happy with their fitness so i've even um, done some fitness work with guides here in the valley as well and these guys are super fit but when they're on a long season they're getting exhausted Plus, they have other challenges of their own that they actually want to fulfill, as well as taking people up and down Mont Blanc. Yeah. So, you know, that's where, as I mentioned near the start of it, it's where fitness becomes more life and death. It sounds mm-hmm. kind of like really dramatic, but actually, if you're training an Ironman athlete, the worst thing's going to happen, they DNF. Yeah. If you're training somebody on a 4,000 meter peak and 8,000 meter peak and they're exhausted, the worst thing that's gonna happen as we see A2 this winter is you don't come back. Um, And so for me, it's kind of like, it heightens my awareness of how much I've got to put into what I give those people. Yeah, no, definitely. And kind of just saying that to extremes where like an organized sport, generally most of them, the worst will be maybe you'll get injured or maybe you just won't finish Mm -hmm. but those kind of other areas it could be life and death in some extreme cases which is pretty eye-opening when when you think about it and yeah like i said i didn't even really kind of think about the fitness element for them or training Mm -hmm. as such you they just kind of are there they're doing those things yeah uh, this is interesting to kind of bring it more towards the front of your mind Mm -hmm. but that's uh, that's pretty crazy wow um, and it's super so, interesting as well. It's yes, really interesting. Definitely. It's always interesting to hear about new things or things you didn't really think about before. Um, where, where for yourself has been the most interesting place you visited or trained or even visited yourself as kind of like um, to do an adventure or some fitness kind of areas? Um. So I went to Aconcagua 
in South America. Mm -hmm. I lose track of time now. I think it's nearly two years ago. That's an amazing adventure in South America. South America is beautiful. Um, I was really, yeah. really pleased to be able to go there and experience their mountains. Uh, the Himalayas are beautiful. Um, I've been to Everest Base Camp, but never beyond. Um, yeah. Uh, I'd look to go back there. Don't know whether 8,000 meter peaks are my thing or not. It's, there's, there's something I have on the cards, which I was meant to have done which was to go to Choyo, um, mm -hmm. which is 8,200 meters. But that was actually in carrying my bike to ride my bike <clears> on the summit plateau to break the world record. But oh, wow. we missed the opportunity of travel because uh, of COVID. And then also the Chinese changed permits as well. So there was a lot of complication. But that's that's still in my mind as a maybe. A maybe. Yeah. A maybe, yeah. So it's always been mountain-based, but then I love to surf. So... I've surfed Barrett's Hossiger in France. I've surfed for a long time as a surf instructor in North Devon. Um, so for me, at times, I get a real urge that I've just got, got to get to the sea. And being nice. here, for us, it's an a eight-hour drive to get to the nearest surfable beach. Oh, wow. So it doesn't happen very often. No, that's, that's no fun. I do like being near the beach. I'm very lucky to live right by. Yeah, right where you are, yeah literally just outside but um yeah. it's yeah that's pretty cool um, well, when we when we do come back and see family we always stay sort of bournemouth and paul and obviously i have a board still with family there so i will always yeah. just go i even actually go if it's flat at bournemouth or boscombe pier i'll just paddle yeah. out <laughs> it's mm -hmm. just because it's kind of look i live in the mountains and you know i haven't been here for a year i need to just get <laughs> wet see. yeah that's, yeah there's uh, there's plenty of people in the mornings yeah, and the very very small swirl that we have here. <laughs> uh, there's still plenty of people out there. Uh, there's so many exotic places and places around the world that you've mentioned. Then, um, obviously, you do some stuff in the UK as well, some training camps. Um, talk to us about those a little bit. Uh, yeah, well, my training camps historically have had all been abroad. So I do training mm -hmm. camps in the Alps for triathletes and cyclists. Uh, I've done them in Spain. I even did some work in Oman, which was helping the Oman um, triathlon governing body and the setting up of what now is they have the Muscat 70.3, uh, mm -hmm. lovely guy that organized that. Um, but the UK, I was going to be doing some this year. Um, I thought I was going to come back. My partner and I were going to have an extended period back in the UK. And I'd set up this three opportunities to run uh, Scarfell, Snowden and Ben Nevis. And people could do it either as all three or they could just do it as a one weekend and do one of them. Yeah. But at the moment, all these things are kind of, they're kind of on hold. Um, I have athletes come out to me here and I do one to one here. So Wendy came out before she went to the pole. I have um, Preet coming out as well, another polar athlete who I'll have over here working and Ed. So there's quite a few that will come out and I'll just do one to ones with. Um, yeah. But no, uh, training camps, uh, <laughs> when you have a large number of people, they're quite tiring. Um, <laughs> you're kind of like you're on hospitality mode 24 seven, as well as instructing or doing whatever you're doing. So as my age now, I kind of prefer the one to ones a little bit more manageable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I guess you can give um, your time Def directly to that person as well especially yeah. when it's something like a polar adventure it's going to take a lot of information a lot of training very specific training and information as well i guess you need that a bit more when it's like that yeah but, and um, it's quite handy that in our valley uh, simon abrams is one of the ale which is people that pretty much run antarctica and people that need to go there if you're going to go he has to assess you so it ties in quite yeah. nicely that they can spend some time here and they get assessed by simon as well so yeah oh, there you go you, you got it you got it set up perfect yeah that was that was accidental <laughs> i'd like <laughs> to valley. say it, it was all planned but no it wasn't this valley sounds very interesting i think uh they need yeah to... it's there's a lot and i mean down the road we have the the large spartan race the uh, morzing which is yeah. a brutal they have the ultra the ultra spartan there um i actually coach a french that. guy You've raced it, so it's yeah, a tough one. Very tough. <laughs> Pr pretty hilly in Morzine. Um, and I have a, f a French athlete that I work with. He's an ultra runner and a Spartan athlete. Um, mm -hmm. And I think 
He's just told me he's got an invite of the Europeans in Switzerland in September. Yeah, which yeah, is just down the road from here. So he's then messaged and gone, oh, right, so I'm doing this ultra, but can we actually now also focus on, I'm like, yeah, no problem. Yes, definitely. Hope, fingers crossed, I shall be there if the travel ah, was okay for the UK. Um, yeah, Morzine 2018 was brutal. Yeah, I nearly died up the mountain, but it was it was. <laughs> I made it in the end. It was all good. No, that's uh, it's amazing. Some really interesting stuff there, John. Um, Cheers. Where where can people find out a bit more about you and what you do, coaching wise, and your projects? Uh, the best bet is to go to the website, which is e3coach.com, um, to follow. I have an e3coach Instagram, and I have my own personal one. Yeah, my, I always think my my own personal one is I try to keep it more focused on myself, and yeah. the company one is much more focused around training and the athletes that I work with. So it's a way to help people see who I work with, become inspired by what other people are doing. Um, mm -hmm. But that information is definitely on the website. Yep, I've had a look at your work Instagram and the pictures are amazing. Many mountains, <laughs> yeah, yeah. many cool pictures. So that's cool. But your personal one is just selfies. So <laughs> yeah. yeah, selfies with a blurred mountain somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's amazing. Um, John, this is kind of the time I'd ask where what you'd be doing this year, what, what you're on the horizon, but obviously <laughs> You've said a few things and they're a bit hampered by COVID and current restrictions, but um, obviously you've got a mind, you've got many projects in your mind ready for the future. Is there any yeah. other ones you haven't mentioned that you think you may go ahead and do? Yeah, there's, um, there's a much more long-term one, which we've already started planning, which is 2023, which is potentially mm -hmm. a, new, a new traverse route across Greenland. Um, working with the glaciologist as well that we've got to go via two i think they call them dig holes which are permanent holes to measure the ice depth and different things but it means it will create a new route so long as no one goes and does it before <laughs> beforehand but yeah so the planning that goes into that there's a lot of extra skills um even weapons handling uh, because of the wildlife is a little bit dangerous um so there's from some extra skills i've got to go and acquire and other team members have got to acquire we've got a few training trips that we'll organize before we all meet yeah. over in greenland but yeah that's i'm really excited about because again i'm going to learn a lot from doing that mm -hmm. myself uh the training side of it as, as well as actually doing the um it's going to be about I think it's a month and a half probably on the snow. So yeah, it will oh, be, in will be really interesting. So that's the biggest one that's going on. Um, the kayaking trip will be a fun one, um, when that can go ahead. And then in between that one and going to Greenland, hopefully kayak around Iceland whilst getting off and summiting and skiing their three highest peaks is another person oh, it's not bad is it? that sounds like a nice little uh, nice little holiday at iceland around yeah iceland's absolutely beautiful kayaking around the outside of it in more winter not maybe quite so fun but yeah you, it, you it, may have it, to wear many a layer but yeah. um <laughs> so yeah that, that that's i think that's it but i mean i'm very very fortunate here we can wake up and i can go and challenge myself every day you know and i'm aware that a lot of people don't have that so to have gone ski up a mountain behind me and ski back down with a friend today and then my partner take the we've got two huskies walk them up to a beautiful lake up in the mountains you know these these to me still are really important challenges and in many ways they're more important to me and more valuable than the big trips you know to be able to go out yeah. a back door and appreciate what we have here yeah no definitely and how many years have you been living in that part of the world now so i've lived here now for three years um but i've been working backwards and forwards for now nearly 14 years here oh wow so you, you know the area by the back yeah, of yeah. Then. uh well it's 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 vast yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah i'd say i'd know that by the back of my hand to certain altitudes and then beyond <laughs> certain altitudes it becomes a little less known yeah there we go no definitely yeah. well it's an amazing kind of journey you've been on over the many years to get to uh, where you are and it sounds like you've got so many projects in the pipeline hopefully that ice that greenland one sounds amazing it could be 
like a groundbreaking one to set a new route, which is uh, yeah. pretty cool. Wow. Um, I implore the listeners to go and uh, check out John's website and definitely check out his uh, work Instagram to see those amazing images. Um, John, it's been a real pleasure to chat to you today um, and learn more about you, learn more about what you've done and your history as well. No, I really appreciate it. I'd like to also, I'd re could reciprocate now and ask you all about yourself and where you see what you're doing going because it's. I think it's really interesting and I think the the world of podcast and stuff, especially in the last twelve months, has been a great way to reach out to people and for people to stay connected and feel connected. So, I think it's amazing what you guys are doing. So yeah, keep keep up the good work. Um, and yeah, I look forward to following your guys' journey with what you do. And if Thank you do, you and if you do come to Switzerland, let me know, and I'll pop in the car and pop over and see you. Definitely, that'd be great. No, thank you very much. It's uh, it makes the podcast job a lot easier when you've got very interesting people on the podcast with great stories. So, uh, thank you very much again, John. And, no problem. Uh, thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day, and uh, catch you soon. Cheers. Thank you very much. Bye.